All right, I want to give you some suggestions about the mediation that's coming up. This is our last step in the program in our Friday afternoons, and so we have gone through now a case analysis session at the beginning. We've talked about preparing for a trial. We've seen that negotiations include some of the same kinds of advocacy skills that we've talked about in the trial, and we're now going to suggest a mediation as a way of resolving at least one part of the dispute between Hewitt and Gonzalez. Now the mediation that we're going to do is a mediation that we are imagining between a defendant, Bauer, and the Sovereign Bank of Georgia, and with Gonzalez. For the Sovereign Bank of Georgia's role in this deal not going forward and not taking Salazar in, and so the question is, is there some mediation that might take place? Recognize that when you're talking about mediating, what you're talking about is a facilitated negotiation, especially if it's a voluntary mediation. If it's a court-ordered mediation and there is some obligation to reach a mediated settlement, if it's not voluntary, then different things could apply. But mediation, by its terms, is supposed to be something that only settles cases still if both of the parties have agreed. And so, voluntary mediations are all about talking through a mediator to your opponent to agree, to get them to agree, to persuade them to move very much like in a negotiation. So who needs a mediator? Well, let me suggest to you that in the real world of mediation, there are times when mediators help deliver messages back to the clients about the weaknesses of the case that somehow the clients are not hearing in their conversations with the lawyers, either because the lawyers are too afraid to tell them about it, or because the lawyers don't have the, the temerity, they don't have the, the guts to tell them about it, or for some reason then they feel like a wise, neutral party will be able to communicate the weaknesses of the client's case better than if in fact it's forced on them, or they feel like it's forced on them by their own lawyer in a negotiated settlement. And so often parties will ask, or the lawyers will tell the parties, do you want to explore some mediation? Shall we try to mediate it? Very often a good mediator can facilitate the conversation to help it go. Or it may be that we suggest to the parties that, look, this person has some expertise in resolving these kinds of matters. They have creative solutions that they have seen before. They've got techniques that they use that help facilitate fair resolutions of of disputes, and so without going through them the full expense, we can get a good sense of what the case is worth if we go into mediation. Now, that conversation, that introduction should tell you that the mediator, who's mediating, what the mediator's view is of their role in the mediation can be very different depending upon the mediator. I would say a large number of mediators who are out there are retired judges who are very used to making decisions and adjudicating the cases. And so they, quote, facilitate the settlements by banging heads, by telling the other side what they think the case is going to be worth if it's tried. They bring that expertise, having tried many cases, and so they say, I think I can give you some read on how a jury is going to see this case. Well, the parties don't have to accept that, but they're persuaded by the judge's experience that, in fact, this is the way that they ought to see the negotiation. If that's the case, then the advocate's role in front of that kind of judge is to persuade the judge about your case, about how strong it's going to be in front of the jury. And then the mediator then turns around and uses that persuasion to go back and persuade the other side about the strengths and weaknesses of the case. Very often what you hear is, is that what a mediator does is it takes then a set of opening statements or clopenings, closing argument openings in combination from the other side, or statements about the case, and then uses that against the other side to suggest that they have real risks and weaknesses and that they ought to settle the case. And that what happens is, is that the mediator tells one all of the bad things that are going to happen to them in court and then tells the other one all the bad things that are going to happen to them in court. That moves the parties in their position bargaining into some kind of an overlap and then from there we can go ahead and facilitate a settlement of the case. That's one model of what's going on. Now another model of what's going on is, is that 
Truly, the mediator sees the mediator's role as being nothing more than to facilitate brainstorming and creative problem solving. And so you can see that this mediator really may be in the school of the problem solving, interest-based bargaining theory of what goes on in negotiation. So a mediator might say to the parties before we get started, do you want me to explore business solutions to the problem? Are there possibilities that in fact the parties could both win if they entered into some kind of a business agreement between them where they could both win? You can see that that's a very different kind of model. Now the mediator is not exploring how the case is going to be tried and what the result is going to be. The mediator is instead exploring with the parties what are the underlying needs and goals, very much like President Carter might explore a mediation between two warring parties. What are your underlying goals and needs and how it is that we can win-win and create peace in a particular situation? So problem-solving negotiators and problem-solving mediators are in sync, but position negotiators and position uh, and problem-solving mediators may not be in sync. Position bargainers may really want to hold weaknesses close to the chest and not reveal uh, needs and goals and other, other kinds of things that are out there because they're afraid of how it's going to be used against them. And the problem-solving mediator then may be asking for information that the negotiator position bargainer is unwilling to give and is not prepared to give. Also, with a problem-solving uh, mediator, the problem-solving mediator says, don't tell me, tell the other side. I'm not going to decide this case. I might give a valuation if both parties ask me to value. But until you ask me to value the case or to predict a finding of fact, I, my job is really nothing more than to facilitate communication between the two of you. So it's very important to ask yourself, what role is this mediator playing? Because if your persuasion is really not to the mediator, you shouldn't really be looking at the mediator when you're persuading. You should be looking to your opponent to persuade them. Your whole style of, of presentation, if it's not to the mediator to judge the case, will be to talk to your opponent, facilitated by questions being asked by a mediator. Now, as you might imagine, the roles that mediators play are not that neat. Very often they bleed again from one to the other, from position bargaining and opening offers into problem solving and back and forth. But it's important to realize that a mediator could have a very much different model for negotiation in mind, the problem solving model, and that would affect the way that the negotiation may be conducted. So let me talk to you about then a series of stages and ask you to prepare depending upon how the mediator sees the, the mediation. So your first one is, as much as you can, are you going to provide an adjudicative role? Or will you not do that unless you've been asked by the parties? Are you going to facilitate communication? As I've said, problem solvers generally then are interested much more, problem solving mediators are much more interested in over statements of, over, uh, overriding statements of the goals of the parties as opposed to an opening statement with a specific demand. They want to know generally what people are looking for. And so instead of saying, I'm looking for a million dollars, two million dollars, four million dollars, I'm looking for an understanding that the bank was wrong in the way that it conducted the negotiations and not putting forward my business case to the business committee, to the loan committee. And I'm looking for the bank, therefore, to make up for the fact that that case was not made on my behalf as a client of the bank. And I'm looking for some, then, compensation to compensate and make up for my not being able to get that loan. And the violation, then, of the duty, I'm also looking for an, uh, indication that the bank going forward, if it's going to do business with me, won't again pick and choose as to whether it's going to represent the business interest before the bank. So I'm looking for some deterrence and for some compensation would be the way that a problem solver would present what they're looking for in the case. And a position bargainer instead would say, we want two million dollars for what the bank did to us. It'll be a position, it'd be an amount of money, and here's why. It's based on the chances of winning and losing at trial. Right? And you see how the difference then varies depending upon the type of mediator you've got. 
It's interesting, many problem solving negotiator, or mediators will say, look at caucusing is not a good idea. Caucusing creates distrust. I want everybody to stay together. There's not confidential information and non-confidential information. Let's stay together and talk and let's understand what each side is looking for here and facilitate that communication right here in front of me. And I'll help you by asking questions that I think are underlying the concerns of the parties. Caucusing is a tool of a classic adjudicative position mediator who is trying to get information given to them in confidence to then generate some movement on the other side, see whether we can get some overlap. Caucusing, then, is like shuttle diplomacy. And mediators very often will offer to caucus with the parties if they feel like that will be helpful. And you should realize that it might be that you decide, I'm not sure I want the mediator to do this. I want to hear what the other side thinks are the needs and goals, and I want to stay in the room. So you might resist the caucus, the mediator. Or it might be that you certainly comply with the mediator's understanding of what they want to do, and it gives you a tip that they're likely to be a position mediator and be engaged in doing some underlying trades of information with the parties in light of confidential communications that they're getting in the individual caucuses. After all, why caucus if that's not what was going on? Recognize that to breach a confidence, the mediator should ask for permission. It cannot give information to the other side unless you, in a caucus, have said it's okay to give the information. And so, if you do go into caucuses, be careful about what you're giving the mediator permission to reveal. Mediator should prompt you about this, but you should realize that if you want something in confidence, you should demand that it be kept in confidence. And here is a technique that I would urge you to, to uh, think about. If you caucus and you have a creative solution that you think the other side might be drawn to, it might be that what you do is you ask the mediator, present it, not as your idea, but as a neutral idea, as an idea that the mediator is thinking about as might uh, overcome the differences between the parties. And so you may prepare strategically before you go into the mediation with your best problem solving offer to ask the mediator to present it as a neutral idea as opposed to an idea that's coming from the individual. And you're waiting to give that idea to the mediator in a caucus setting. Now, brainstorming is something that very often mediators will do with parties individually or they will do with the parties collectively. And when you're thinking about that, remember that the mediator can be very useful in thinking of different options that the parties might consider. And so it might be that you ask the mediator, in your experience, do you have any options as to how we might solve this problem from your experience of mediating? Are there business solutions that you've seen that are working? What are the advantages and disadvantages of any particular option that we ought to consider as we're thinking about the risks that we are causing by considering whether these are good solutions to the problem? Again, then, the mediator can provide expertise. It can be expertise on adjudication, like a retired judge. It can be that the mediator's expertise is in helping you analyze the options that you've got. Your preparation should then include, might we ask the mediator for their expertise to help us in these evaluations? Recognizing that finally, the difference between a mediation and an arbitration and a trial is that the mediation is all about the parties and they're voluntarily accepting the mediated solution. And so you always have a veto. You always have a veto. And your problem solving then that you do is done, and your persuasion that you do, is not to try to get the mediator to adjudicate, but it is finally to get the other side to agree to the solutions that are before it. So some thoughts for you on mediating in the context of litigation and uh, business litigation settlements. Thank you.